Hi, welcome to worship today. Um, today, our scripture and our uh, message are going to be from the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be talking about being called to justice. So we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 5. About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families, we need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields and vineyards and homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy, and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We have already sold some of our daughters, and we are helpless to do anything about it, for our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. When I heard their comp complaints, I was very angry. After thinking it over, I spoke out against the, these nobles and officials. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. At the meeting, I said to them, we are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners, but you are selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Then I pressed further. What you are doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God? in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain, but now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day, and repay the interest you charged when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. They replied, we will give back everything and to be nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priest and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. The whole assembly responded, amen, and they praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The first thing that you must understand in this story is that Nehemiah was a construction leader, not a great prophet. Jerusalem had been conquered and its people had gone into exile. Those left were left without defense. Their wall needed desperate repair. So this man, a Jew who worked for a foreign king heard about this. He heard that those left in Jerusalem needed help. So he went to his boss and asked for permission to take a vacation to go on a mission trip to fix the wall. His boss not only gave him permission, but sent him a crew and supplies for the mission. So this regular Joe, Nehemiah, came to repair that wall. And this book of Nehemiah is all about that mission trip. Most of the book focuses on the outsiders against his mission and the roadblocks they put in his way. But here, in our scripture this morning, he has to deal with something that shouldn't have fallen to him. He must deal with the outcry of the people, those being financially disabled by their brothers and sisters. This had nothing to do with his wall or his mission. It was not his job. You know, sometimes God sends us to do something that we don't see as our job. But God sees righting wrongs as every Christian's job. God calls all of us to justice. If we hear the outcry, we are responsible no matter what our position. Whether we're a housewife, a child, a retiree, a construction worker, or a secretary, whether we own companies or don't work at all, part of being a Christian is hearing people that have been wronged, of working for a just world. 
There's something completely otherworldly, something completely Christian, something the Spirit of God must do in us to react to pain and harm that our culture approves of. It's something that God must do through us that we cannot do on our own. And it's something that the whole body of Christ is responsible for. We are all called to justice. Now, the problem in Jerusalem was that people in Jerusalem community were harming other Jews through the economic systems they practiced. I don't know why, but it's easier sometimes to respond and protect when the danger is from the outside. But when the danger is on the inside, it often goes unchecked. The problem here is an internal problem, a problem among insiders, friends and family. For some reason, when we are part of a system of injustice, we often shrug our shoulders and tell those who are harmed, that's just the way it is. That was definitely true in Jerusalem. Jews were functioning under this normal economic system of buying and selling. And because of a famine, things had gotten really rough for some families. Those with greater means were putting those of lesser means in dire circumstances. Not only that, but the rich were selling the poor into slavery after they had bought them out of slavery. This injustice was killing the whole body. When the Jews were taking unfair advantage of each other, they were bringing hardship and harm on the whole community. It's not too hard to see the parallels in America. When we harm someone or allow someone to suffer, we are hurting all of God's people. And we as Christians believe there is not a person who is not God's person. Every body is made in the image and likeness of God. Regardless of what faith they have, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their gender, regardless of their ability, every body is made in the image and likeness of God. Not only that, but as Christians, we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ to the world. So when we allow any harm to come to any human, we allow harm to God. When we allow any harm to come to any human, we allow harm to God. So what? So what can we possibly do? Systems of injustice are so big, are so ingrained. How can we possibly make a dent in changing them when they are like the air we breathe? Well, Nehemiah gives us a starting point, an example of how to start. See, Nehemiah brought the problem to the attention, so no one in the community could ignore it. No matter who you are, if you're aware of a system that is hurting people, you, as a Christian, have a responsibility to bring up the problem. Nehemiah has to say some hard things. He has to bluntly bring the sin forward. He has to tell the rich Jews that, they, that what they are doing is wrong and it's hurting the body. He has to confess that he is a rich Jew who has done wrong and has hurt the body. But just like Nehemiah, God calls us to call out systems of oppression, systems that may favor us, that may make us privileged. He calls us to call out those systems of oppression and harm. He calls us to say, this is not justice. This is not God's way. And there is a better way to go forward. Nehemiah doesn't stop there with an accusation. 
See, Nehemiah continues by setting the example of what reconciliation looks like. He didn't just tell the nobles they were wrong. He took responsibility for his part in the system. And he made retribution for his actions and set right what he had done wrong. Sometimes it takes more than just the sorry. It takes a change of behavior. And Nehemiah was willing to step out in faith and be the first to change his behavior that was benefiting him. He was the one who took the first steps, took out his pocketbook, and returned the money and interest to the Jews in poverty. God has, just as he called Nehemiah, has called you to not only be the whistleblower, but the first to walk to the other side of the line and right the wrongs committed. Because justice does not come by us continuing as things are. Because justice does not come by us continuing things as they are. It takes a willingness to see others as sacred. It takes a voice. It takes action. It takes personal change to change a community. As we end today, I want to remind you that a call to justice is not only a call a few Christians answer, but it is a vow we make in our baptism when we answer the question, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, to resist injustice, to resist oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Let us today answer that baptism vow once more. I do. Let us pray together. God, as we come to you today, we know that there are issues of injustice in our community, in our country, in our world. Burden our hearts to be vessels of your grace, vessels of your change. Help us to stand and name the injustice that we see around us, even, especially, if we are the ones who are privileged by it. Lord, help us to take on the responsibility of how those systems have benefited us at the harm of others. Help us to think of creative ways to make those things right, to make a change. Help us to be a voice like Nehemiah calling for change in our community. And help us remember, God, that all people are your people, made in your image and likeness. There is no us and them. There is only all of us together. Move us to be channels, agents of justice. Please join us in this affirmation of our call to justice. I refuse to believe that we are unable to influence the events around us. I refuse to believe we are bound by racism, war, and injustice. I believe those around me are my brother and my sister. I believe in dignity every day and that our brokenness can be healed. I believe we can overcome oppression and violence without reporting to it, resorting to it. This means I seek to reject vengeance and retaliation. I remember hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. Praise God.
God from whom all 